that song I was just referring to, No Choice, um, we had done tons of mm-hmm. content when it first came out. And maybe the visual wasn't right for it. And maybe the audio needed yeah. the right visual accompaniment. Maybe the song we're promoting right now, it's not the right sound bite. And maybe a year from now, I'll maybe run a clip with the bridge instead. You know, and I think there's so much potential there. Um, and, and for me, it's exciting. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't go viral for every, you know, several videos of ours that have gone viral, but I could talk on and on about the different ways we've been able to capture viral videos. And I'd say a majority of them were on pieces of content that we wouldn't have expected. What's going on? Welcome to the new music business. I'm your host, Ari Herstan, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book, third edition, out now, all formats, hardcover, ebook, audiobook, however you like books, you can find it anywhere right now. Today, my guest is Fly by Midnight. I'm falling, I'm infinitely falling for you. They are a duo currently based out of Los Angeles, originally from New York, and they have a very impressive history and present, actually. They started as YouTubers. Uh, The band consists of Justin Bright and Slavo. Justin started kind of doing his own YouTube thing. These guys met uh, during a writing session, and then over the last few years, they've grown from just an internet band, kind of making covers on YouTube to releasing original music that started to to catch on, to really growing it through all the social platforms, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, of course, all of that. And then not just staying internet-based, they have built a substantial touring business, and they've toured all over Asia. They have a big fan base in Asia. They've toured Malaysia, Japan, China, Taiwan, Indonesia. Uh, They toured around the States as both support acts, and they did a big headline tour this past spring. So we talk about all of that. We talk about their strategy. They're very, very smart. They produce all of their own music themselves. Uh, They market all their stuff themselves. They are completely DIY. We talk about the distributors they use and and how they went about those decisions. So it was a very, very illuminating conversation. I loved having this conversation. They actually hit me up. They hit me up saying, hey, fans of the show would love to come on the show, which Brings me to say, if if you're listening to this and you're a fan of the show and you want to come on the show and think you you want to like pull the curtain back on your business, I'd love to have you. Just uh, just hit us up. You can you can shoot me a DM. You can email us info at ariestake.com. I'd love to chat with you. I'd love to have you on the show. You can find Fly By Midnight anywhere you find music, Spotify, TikTok, Instagram, all of that. Uh, Their numbers are also very impressive. They have uh, over uh, half a billion streams and views across the DSPs and YouTube. They have hundreds of thousands of followers and subscribers. But, you know, a lot of people have impressive numbers these days. What impressed me most is that they leveraged what they were doing on the internet in the real world and are selling real tickets and have real fan bases. I went through the, uh, you know, the Reddit boards and and all of that and and was just kind of seeing their their fan base in action. It's very impressive. So go check out Fly By Midnight. Uh, listen to their music. They're great uh, artists. I, I really dig their songs. They're hook masters. So yeah, it was a really, really fun conversation. Check them out. Find them everywhere. Uh, you can find all of us that make the show happen at Ari's Take on Instagram, Threads, TikTok, X, and you can find me at Ari Herstan on Instagram. You can visit ariestake.com, get on the email list. That's where you're gonna get the most up-to-date information about the new music business. That's the best way to stay in touch with us. Go to ariestake.com, get on the email list. Uh, But right now, if you could just pause this, uh, hit follow, hit subscribe, leave us a five-star review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. However you listen to this, hit the five-star review, hit the thumbs up if you're on YouTube, all of that. I also should note that the guys had some connection issues on their end, and some of the audio cuts in and out at times, but the conversation was too great for us to remove that completely or to cut the episode, even though it doesn't quite meet our quality standards and the standards that you're used to listening to this show. So just wanna let you know, there'll be a couple moments of that. All right, let's kick into the show. Fly by Midnight, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, man. Hello. How you doing? What's up, guys? 
Um, yeah, so I'm I'm uh, I'm catching you at an interesting time. I know that you just finished. Uh, well, just as relative, but you finished a massive tour. It looked like um, in in May. I want to say a couple months ago. Um, and this was uh, this was the headline tour, right? Yeah, I can't believe that was only like a couple months ago. Uh, th- this past <laughs> year has been a little bit crazy by us, and uh, yeah, 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 it was it was uh, an amazing amazing experience. Right? We coined it the thrill. Now tour. I gotta ask the thrill tour. You what'd you say? I said we coined it the thrill tour. It was a thrill. The thrill tour. Now why'd you call it the thrill tour? We because so we the way we release stuff and the way our project worked is is we're very like as it as it comes we do it and uh, the idea of the the tour we wanted to make it like album branded but we're not ready to release the album. So we wanted something like sure. adjacent theme wise to what we're going for. So the thrill is what we we landed on. Yeah, it's sort of like a little bit of a teaser of what's to come. Um, but it it's cool because we sort of we trust each other so much with the process now, and we're both you know very proactive in different aspects of the project. But I think we were in the studio one day, and I just like said the thrill to you, and and you were like, yeah, that's the name of the tour. I was like, oh shit, that that was Sick. quick. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have? Um... I mean, I don't know how much you want to give away, but uh, do you have a, a song called The Thrill coming up? Or do you have like a, a part of the, the record that's coming up? Something I'm assuming the, the Thrill, you're teasing something that's coming up. Yeah, right? I think the best way... No comment. The, the best way to put it is like um, the adrenaline surrounding the Thrill and the speed of the Thrill. Oh, okay. Um, it embodies Sick. sort of where our minds are at in in life as people right now, but also for this next project. Did I say that well? I, I tried. Excellent. Yeah, <laughs> that was really well, well, well put, well put. <laughs> um, so I have to ask: when you were playing, uh, I don't know, Madison, Wisconsin, at the High Noon Saloon, did you see my sticker up on the green room wall there? Oh, I love that green room, <laughs> that cute little one in the back corner, right? Yeah, yeah. With all the stickers, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, lo- I love that. Venue. Probably gotten covered up by this point. It's been a few years since I played the you, High Noon. You know Saloon, what's funny, but, Ari? Yeah. I actually, I think I did see it because it, no, because <laughs> yes! I. Br- you should have sent me a photo. Bullshit. <laughs> no, because I, bullshit, no, I, I shit. brought, I brought your name up at some point on this tour, and maybe it was because of that. Yeah, yeah. shit subliminal just subconscious that's why we put our stickers around right 100%. you don't know why you're thinking of it and it's just coming up and referencing <laughs> it but this is why and this is why we're talking right yeah. now yeah <laughs> that's sick um yeah no that's fun it looked it's great so um now you guys have had quite a journey um you know before we get into the new music which is excellent and congratulations by the Thank way you. on uh releasing the new, I, I don't know if we can call it an EP because I think you're waterfalling this new release, but the race lap <laughs> one third uh, with Super Fine, The Weather, and Try. Uh, great songs, great little little batch that we got there. Uh, yeah, Super Fine, instant, instantly stuck in my head. That's just like ear candy, earworms, just like hasn't left. And that's one that I've just like been humming it. And uh, it's like you don't even realize that that you're humming. It is just like you know, you guys are are masters at writing hooks, and this one's no exception. This one might be one of my favorites. Thank you so much. Uh, Congrats appreciate on that. that, man. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. Um, but I want to step back a little bit because uh, yeah, you guys have had quite an evolution, and it seems like you've done a really um, intentional. I would say you maybe you've been quite intentional about maybe what has been left up on the internet. And maybe what you have scraped because um, and, and I and I love to hear from you. This is just my uh, guess, because I know, you know, I saw some of the early, early, early videos that you did back in the day uh, cover videos, and they were very well produced. I mean, these were like the era where they look like full on music videos for covers like you're kind of going. And I think I read somewhere that you may you directed and edited all those videos and everything like that and and all of that. And you started with a lot of coverage your first album with a covers album at least that's what's left up online uh, but talk talk to me about this evolution from like starting with covers why did you start with that did you start with that i don't that's just what i'm seeing on the internet i don't know what came before that if there was um and then how we get to here where you have hundreds of millions of streams you're headlining clubs all over the, all over the the country and you're doing this independently and you've been really doing the diy grind for so long there's a lot there but take it wherever you want to take it. yeah i mean (laughs) um you are correct we actually we released our first single brooklyn uh adjacent to a cover right so that we we, from the beginning we were slowly releasing original music alongside of it 
But I'll say that, um, okay. you know, a lot of artists uh, look back on those days and you're right, that was a very specific time period, right? Uh, a mm-hmm. snapshot of like uh, music culture, I feel like. Um I, I mean, fuck, man. I got a ton of those early cover music videos right. fired somewhere around the YouTube's internet somewhere. It's like, I tried to scrape some of them, and at some point, I'm just like, ah, fuck it. It is what it is. I'm going to And, and honestly, <laughs> to, to that point, Ari, we are, we're pretty proud of that stuff still. Um, I yeah. think you're correct. We directed all of them. Slavo edited um, all of them. And I think for us, I'll just say this, that I think through that process, we learned a lot about how our voices blend together. We learned a lot about the yeah. craft um, and really perfecting and fine tuning it through those covers while adjacently nice. learning how to become better writers, better producer. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we had some, we had some funny times making those too. Um, is there anything you'd add? Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the reason we started that way was pretty natural. Um, when we met, Justin was doing the solo thing and had you even put out any original I guess anything that you were like pushing? No, no, I hadn't put out any original content. So he was doing a solo thing on YouTube and had the the platform already started and had some videos that had some traction on it. And the cover thing was where you were at at the time. So it was like a normal thing for us to... He wanted to do original stuff. I remember when I started working with him and then we decided to do the duo. So it was like a cool way to introduce us on his platform. Mm. And, you know, we hit the inevitable drop off of subscribers. People are like, what is this? It's not what I signed up for. And um, I know you always right. push for like, you know, just get through that initial wave and they're going to be used to the cover stuff anyway. So we'll just keep doing that. And like you said, for us, it became a natural thing to do, but also a really cool way to explore what we wanted to do sonically with this new project. Mm-hmm. Um, it gave us a lot of, uh, you know, pressureless, I don't know if that's a word, but it was an easy way to, you know, explore those things and do things a little more experimentally. And um, yeah, yeah, it was fun in the process too. We We really bonded, I feel like a lot through those initial videos and, it was a cool way to get the project started for sure that's great and um yeah so how did you meet we met in a uh well actually we worked together in a writing session but the first time we met slavo came to a mm-hmm. very cringeworthy performance of mine um, it was epic <laughs> it was it was far from epic um i was uh in new york it, it was in staten island new york it was a, a county fair <laughs> it was like some summer fest thing which is oh. appropriate for the times but uh uh-huh. it's currently summer if, i yeah. don't know when this is coming out but um he was in a tank top had like the the classic staten island shades on i was like who is this guy and um he ended up being really nice and we we got along really well and then we uh ended up getting in a writing session together and then um yeah I'll a say. lot of people think that we've been best friends before music and that we grew up together Mm -hmm. but we really met through music and um we kind of started off as music friends before we became like best friends if that makes sense yeah yeah and and i i i missed this in the backstory biography because there's so much there but uh did i justin you were doing the youtube thing before you guys started and you were kind of a solo youtuber would we yeah so that when you reference things being scrapped on the internet that i would say is the the most intentional scrapping because yep. um, what we did was um, I'd started a YouTube channel. Um, uh, I guess I was in high school. What was the handle again? Oh, I gee. think do it today. Ta- talent Amplified. Yeah, <laughs> baby. Um, nice. Amplified. I had uh, a... <laughs> uh, rock on. Um, <laughs> yeah. I had uh, accumulated, I think, like 65K subscribers at the time. Um, just for And yeah, and at that point, I appreciate that. At that point, I was kind of at this... Um, you know, trying to figure out, uh, do I need to still, you know, work part time as a pool boy? Because I'm, a- I'm finally monetizing these videos, and from there, it was writing for the original project and trying to do that. And um, I, I, it wasn't fun. I felt everything was really not organic and not genuine. Yeah. And um, when I met yeah. Slavo, I at that time I'd already been thinking of like, you know, am I going to start a band? Am I going to start a duo project? What's that going to look like? Um, and then when we worked together, we had originally written for, I guess, for me, right? And then, um, you know, Slavo had uh, laid down a harmony of some sort. And I was like, this is going to work. Mm. Um, we're going to rebrand my entire YouTube channel, actually change the name overnight. And people are going to be like, what? Like, I subscribed 65,000 people, subscribed to Justin Bright. We're going to lose people. Yes. But I genuinely believed yes. that um, the stuff that we were already starting to make in our chemistry... We were just going to gain new people, and if um, half of those people didn't want to stick around, that's okay. Um, and and we yeah. saw a massive drop off. And then, uh, what would you say? Two videos later, 
we it started coming back up and I was like, oh, I, I made the right gamble <laughs> here. It's some pretty cringe shit back then too. Like some of the videos we initially <laughs> didn't. I don't blame people for dropping off. But wait, yeah, the way we the way we announced <laughs> the band, it sounded like we were on the Disney Channel. Or it was something. like I spun around in the chair, and he like was like, "This is him." And I was like, "This is really, yeah. this is how we're revealing it, huh?" This is what we're doing. <laughs> I mean, that was the YouTuber persona yeah. <laughs> of the era, and I didn't see what your persona was, Justin. Obviously, uh, back in the day, but you know, maybe it was a bit of that, and uh, that's just kind of you know what it was. But like, that's that's like what this new era is for so many is discovering it figuring it out in real time in public and that's like what the internet is and that's kind of like as all of these pop artists and newer artists and artists honestly of every genre at this point especially hip-hop is like you're growing up on the internet you're growing up in public in real time and so it's like i think that's the biggest difference between artists of your <laughs> and artists of today are like you know the artists that have come before, um, everything was uh, kind of developed behind the scenes in the background, and then it came out, quote unquote, perfect. It came out in uh, yeah. after the it went through the machine, and you only saw the finished product. But nowadays, everyone's kind of growing up. But which you mentioned, Justin, cringe and how cringe it was. It's just like shit. I think everything, every artist looks back on something and they're going to cringe at something, whether it's like. And there's no such thing as objective cringe because every it, that's that's subjective. But we're all all gonna cringe. I'm sure you cringe at songs that you released like just a few years ago or something. Because like, man, I, I would have done that better, or whatever. But it's cool to just see like that is the journey. Now, following along those lines, I'm curious about the intention of like, you know, was was that intentional? Like, let's start with covers, the two of us. Let's do this thing, or let's start with originals. You mentioned Brooklyn, you released alongside of your covers one. Uh, but I noticed with Brooke, your first release, your first original release, uh, was accompanied with a very high quality music video of a really cute kid lip syncing along. It's a great video. Go check it out. Oh boy. But so like, talk to me about that process of starting this out. And like, did you have this all mapped out where the whiteboards out? It's like, all right, this is our five year plan. This is how it's going to go. Or how did it go? I wouldn't say it was a five year, but yeah, it was definitely intentional. I think the idea was it's okay. going to be cold Turkey enough to switch people over to a new project overnight um, yep. from whatever fan base I'd accumulated or whatever interest I had uh, built. But then it was like, sure. instead of doubling up and just only giving them original content, maybe you know we'll also do covers as well. Um, because at that at that time, Ari, I'm sure you could uh, recall too, that was the real way to you know build a cold audience, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I didn't want to completely mm -hmm. yes. you know um, turn my back on. You know, those people and some people, it's crazy. I still talk mm -hmm. to people now and all they listen to is covers of songs. Like I, I didn't, I forget mm -hmm. that that's still a niche that people still are into. Um, but back then it was a lot more popular. Um, and I would say too, yeah. not to toot our own horns, but like that was a very common strategy back then. And we knew that. And I think like today's brain, right? With how saturated everything is, it's like, how niche can you be? How different can you be? Like, let's do the same thing everyone else is doing, but stand out in our own way. And I feel like we like we're on the cusp of something, mm -hmm. which is why our channel and our, our stuff resonated so well back then. Because there were so many of these mm -hmm. like clean produced uh, YouTube cover videos. The voices sounded great. Like the style was kind of all the same, whether it was acoustic or it was like something very pop. I feel like we were like, okay, we yep. want to do retro pop. That was like when 1989 was the biggest, is, uh, you know, when that just came out. So that was like very hot. We were into that sound. We're like, let's do some like retro pop stuff. Let's do the covers this way. And let's come up with like one idea that is super low budget. We could do it DIY. We could do many of them. And we don't have to worry about getting a team together every time to do it. And it's going to stand out enough and look good and be simple enough, but still creative. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it seemed to work. And um, we put a lot of effort, which I think was a big part of the reason why we started off on the right foot. Um, and it also mm -hmm. taught us early on that, you know, DIY is a, a very... Uh, productive thing for our project. Correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of going backward from those music videos, I don't think for a long time we ever did music videos that were that expensive <laughs> again. It was, a, it was a big learning lesson for us and our project. Um, yeah, and like Slavo said, I think those covers, mm -hmm. we learned a lot about our friendship to work together. And mm -hmm. I, um, a lot of the stuff that we've released and um, I'd say the solo stuff was a lot more cringe to me. I think the stuff when it was just Slavo and I starting off is more endearing yeah <laughs> yeah um so i uh 
Okay, well, that's interesting. To know. Now, you know, uh, something that maybe you learned, Justin, during this process, um, I'm curious about, like, the um, the frequency and not even not even going on the quality because like they all look high quality to me whether whatever the budget was you know you guys know the budget but like that's that's something that i think you've probably mastered is like making something look a lot more expensive than it actually is but um the 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 amount of i hate the word content but the amount of content that you were putting out the videos that you were releasing and the frequency how intentional uh was that two in terms of uh early on like knowing at least with your history that like oh we have to get on a regular schedule we have to release music and videos and just keep that flowing yeah i'm um consistency was something we've always preached from the start uh, uh you know previously before fly by minute i think releasing videos every what, i mean what did we used to do every month every two weeks there was a there was definitely an intentional thought there um uh, Slavo said mm -hmm. we we admired a lot of what other channels released, but we said, you know, how can we put our own print on it? And what what we ended up with, um sort of like um like mini episodic brands for certain covers. There was a wave of covers that we did. I'd I'd argue to say our most successful mm -hmm. covers were in front of fast food restaurants, um, where we would be yeah. consuming stuff while covers and um uh, although, like, um, you know, s some of them didn't like do as the great Sonic as others. the video where the guy is rollerblading, roller skating up to your uh, your truck that you're sitting on. Was that for oh, yeah. Umbrella? Which one was that for? That was for... Uh, was that, was that? That, 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 that was Camila Cabello song? Oh, no, that was the... Uh, Medley. Yeah, I forgot. That was the, the mashup of Maroon 5 and Camila. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's right, yeah. That yeah, and then fun. we did the Umbrella one, which was, I mean, geez, what a whole story that was in itself. Um yeah, there was just, mm -hmm. there was just a lot of, but I think we've been in grand fly by midnight's plan, mm -hmm. and although it drives our team probably crazy mm -hmm. now, how consistent we want to release content uh, and content. We're right. not like we're we're, we're artists, uh, of course, but I don't think we get discouraged by this new digital age of promotion and calling things content and like you know it's either you know get with the times or. You know, it's just not for you these days. <laughs> I know that sounds harsh, but that's it's definitely where our uh, mind funny too. Right because now. I feel like a lot of the the original stuff in our our brains, how they worked back then, translate to today. But it's funny because I feel like the more we uh, moved on in the project, we tried old culture of albums and release, mm. inter you know interweave those into whatever we were doing uh, currently. And it's funny because like when we started embracing that, then I feel like we got a lot. Of industry credit like we were still relevant and like hmm. still doing our thing content wise and we all our fans loved it but then embracing that mindset and it's so annoying but it's true like we started you know sessions opened up for us a little more we, we saw you know different industry things you know you can go through the checklist of things but it's it's funny because we wanted to play that game for that reason and it worked out in that way and i'll i'll just piggyback off of that and say that our i feel like the trajectory of fly by midnight has always been uh, you know, we started off as YouTubers. The industry said, "You're you're YouTubers. You're not. Mm -hmm. uh, you have nothing on Spotify." We're like, "Okay." And then we get on Spotify, and the industry said, "Oh, you're just on Spotify. You'll never sell a ticket." And now we're touring, and it's kind of like we've had this thing where we've constantly been told, "I think that we're just this," and then we're like, "No, just give us a year, and we'll be you know more than that." And and I think um, I mean I'm really proud of us for that. Totally. We'll speak to that a little bit. Um. You know, because I think there is an inferiority complex with a lot of artists. I mean, let's let's just be real. Every artist has an inferiority <laughs> complex of some kind, no matter who you are, or what stage you're at. Uh, even the biggest superstars in the world have that. Um, but, you know, I have spoken to some artists that have kind of broken out uh, online. And, you know, it, it, it's interesting because on one hand... Everybody thinks that's the only way to break out these days, and the only way to get support is to do it, you know, online. As from, you know, now it's TikTok, and previously it was YouTube. But, um, you know, and I think the artists that do catch that way might have some like not. They don't feel like they might have the the support necessarily of the industry as much. Or there's a uh, Ricky Montgomery has been public about this. We had him on the show, but he said like there's a stank 
on these artists that got signed from the internet and and like kind of broke off, broke out from TikTok or whatever. Um, and there's always a skepticism, no doubt that, you know, like you said, you put it really, really well, like you have, you have, you can do it on YouTube, but can you translate over to streaming to Spotify? Okay. You translate it on to Spotify, but can you sell a ticket? Um, and then no one really, I, I think, you know, we keep moving the goalposts of like, what is, um, relevant and like where the quote unquote industry thinks it's, uh, you deserve or like when you're going to get, start to get credit from the industry. So I guess my question is, uh, when did you feel like you were starting to one, like resonate with, with an audience, like a real fan base with your original music. And then when did you feel like you were resonating with the industry or getting like significant industry interest? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say significant industry interest, I feel like, is continually a work in progress, you know? Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I just <laughs> sure. I just feel like, um, you know, sometimes uh, independent acts, although, you know, we're making a living, we're supporting our families, we're paying for the roof over our head, there's still this sort of, like, you know, uh, there's just a separation of sorts that I still think we're trying to figure out and even trying to figure out if it's sure. needed. You know, like, we we are growing fans every day. Do we need the industry credit the press that this the, yeah that, i like to yeah. think too of like our version of industry is like editorial looks it's opportunities for touring like to us like the label side of things i guess the only the only real uh, appreciation we, we need there is if we wanted some kind of feature um or something like that so and you mean like editorial looks you're talking about streaming mm -hmm. like like playlist editorial these days we're not talking traditional uh you know magazine website blog editorial anymore. exactly and not to say that, you know, that's, I mean, we have, Justin can talk for days about that stuff, but like we've definitely put that on the back burner when it comes to us because we've noticed that it doesn't really, um, it's not productive for us at this point in our career. So what isn't? Uh, traditional press. Traditional press. Yeah. Just feel, traditional yeah. press. Got it. Okay. But playlists are still. That's very know, relevant. That, I feel like nice... to, to our credibility yeah. industry wise, that's what my, why I bring sure. that up, you know, like have our release radar. Yep. We have the people that come to shows. We know kind of what we have accomplished and what we are working off of when it comes to fans. And, uh, you know, we have the discord that Justin runs and, and we have that like solid fan base at this point in our career that we're really proud of. And we, uh, appreciate them, you know, more than I think they'll ever know. But when it comes to the industry look like the editorial stuff and the, the opportunities we've got, and I feel like it's funny, you know, what does industry even mean? Right. That to me, that's what that means for us. And, um, I yep. feel like the first time we really got that recognition was on, uh, what was it? Rerunning? back in the day yeah it was our song you belong yeah um and we started getting we got that initial apple look and then i feel these different ds even to this day like super fine we mentioned before you know we're struggling to mm -hmm. get better looks for that you know and it's like we're, mm -hmm. we're we're happy with what so we always want to strive for more and more and uh yeah <laughs> and, right. and yeah i'll oh, go ahead mm -hmm the first first wave of our music when we had released we had been hit up and like i um i think one of the first managements that reached out was modest management at the time uh which you know had one direction and um that was very early on that was like after our second single so i think we were we were getting hit up and but um i mean i could talk for for days about the label meetings we had and after a while, we were really just kind of <laughs> not not into it, you know, um, and not I wouldn't say not into it, but not not actively seeking of our project. I think we were we mm -hmm. on each other to realize that that is not an end goal that we want to aspire for. We'll speak to a little bit of the the label conversations. Like, when did you start to get label interest? Because as as we all know, you know, most uh, labels, well, especially major labels, are not really looking, you know, they're not interested in an artist until they have those numbers and they have already established kind of a following in an audience and are, are streaming pretty significantly already. So, like, when did you start to get kind of label interest and what were, what were you know, how many songs did you put out by that point and what were the numbers looking like and, and like, how many times have you toured? Or like, where was the where was the status of your career? I'm just curious when the label started to, to get the interest. yeah. And Slavo, tell me if I'm I'm wrong. I feel like over our career, labels have sort of floated into the picture and out a few times. Um, I think in the beginning, mm -hmm. 
I I don't know when we started talking to Epic and Capital. How many years ago that was? I remember having a meeting and um, our Spotify top five that you can see the most popular one of them, at least one of them, maybe multiple, were still a cover, which to me kind of puts us like I could see what time period that would be. So like we were still kind of a, a mixture of I think uh, original stuff and and um, and covers, but the the original stuff definitely wasn't doing as well as the covers were. So we were still in that like kind of transition period, I think. Yeah, and um, and I sure. think we had a, a couple of those sit downs. But the the reason I, I bring up the in and out thing was then I remember um, I think we had sort of slowed those conversations down, and then we had released a music video for a song of ours called "Love Me Like a Friend." Um, and that went viral on YouTube, and then all of a sudden, everyone out of the woodworks flooded the inbox, like every major. Hmm. Um, and then in a week, it just amounted to nothing again. <laughs> and it's kind of been this, <laughs> you know, it's just been this interesting in and out. And I think um, maybe it was with our previous manager, but I, I think we had expressed just a level of fatigue of kind of like mm-hmm. having these discussions. And also, you know, we were growing. To Slavo's point, I, I love uh, that you brought that up because. Uh, our top five songs, a goal Slave and I had made were like, oh, easy. By next year, our top five songs will all be originals. And and that's a done mm-hmm. deal. And and under a year we made that happen. So I think, you know, going back to one of your initial questions, Ari, like we we certainly have goals for ourselves that we throw out there and um and we make it our priority to make it make it happen. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. And um well I'm curious, we you know, I, I think we've we've now um been in this this TikTok obsession uh, for so long that I I feel like we've forgotten that things used to go viral on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so when you said like oh it went viral on YouTube, I'm like wait oh yeah shit did used to go viral on YouTube. Um, so I, I looked this up and this fly, um, love me like a friend came out in December of 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what does that mean when it went how? I I've like forgotten. How did shit go viral back then? How did it go viral? Like, talk to me about what a a viral uh, moment feels like when it's something's going viral on YouTube versus you've had many viral things on on TikTok and Instagram. Maybe speak to the difference between like what was then and what is now in terms of how things go viral and what virality looks like and and the the staying power of it. Yeah, I'd say um, so. That was our first original that went viral. Um, we had our first taste of like real virality on a cover early on of a song called we don't talk anymore um and mm-hmm. at that point i mean geez like, what was that a hundred million or is it, it was something cra- crazy wow. on a third party channel yeah um that had oh, okay. re-uploaded it and thankfully we claimed it i figured you, you'd like to know that ari um but, yes thank you <laughs> you're getting yeah. paid on it now as um, you should but Good. uh for love me like a friend um I remember, I think it was 700,000 in under 24 hours. Um, and uh, YouTube, YouTube views. views. And f- yeah. fun fact about that, um, and then I'll, I'll shut up for a second, but uh, we were talking about cheap music videos. <laughs> and that was, uh, what, a, a $50 music video where we were eating pizza and playing Call of <laughs> Duty in between takes? Yeah, yeah. It was, that was a fun day too. Those are always the best one. It's like super easy. And now, Yeah, did you have like... Did you, what was the promotion and marketing behind that video or did it just magically catch through the algorithm of YouTube? Beautiful learning lesson that I, it's nice to talk to you about this because it reminds me as I'm running ads currently for our new music, um, there were zero ads ever ran on that song, ever. Um, okay. We yeah. talk about this a lot too, Crazy. where it's like, and especially in the world of TikTok, where it's like, we're trying to figure it out ourselves still and, and some things pop and we're starting to yeah. get a better grasp of at least what works for us. But the Mm -hmm. idea of like, you know, is the song the reason why people are coming to it? Is the visual the reason why? Like, is it a mixture of both? Like, what is it per thing that does well? And um, it's like such a question mark, right? And and it's funny because you brought up the, you know, that virality versus today's virality where I feel like we are seeing it in real time, which I think is really cool. Um, we, the last tour we did, I don't know, I guess it was this tour, right? The, this past tour we did, we were at uh, some of these venues in the VIP where we're meeting fans and stuff. And we had a few instances where, you know, uh, one of the videos that was going viral at the time, um, we had a fan that showed up to VIP and said, I saw this last week and thought it was so good that I bought a VIP ticket and now I'm here. And that happened many times, mm-hmm. which is like, you wow. know, you think it's, it's exciting wild. to 
to be able to do it and get the streams and get the fans, you know, into you. But when you see someone show up to a show, especially VIP, I mean, that's, it's not a, you know, it's a elevated experience, obviously. So it's like to, to put that effort into it after seeing us a week before is incredible to me. And it's, it shows you the power of a platform like TikTok. And I, and I think to touch on that too, I was talking about how our morale is, you know, pretty healthy on this new, uh, new music business. Uh, new industry, and uh, <laughs> and and I think it is because we we are seeing that tangibility of like, um, there's another funny moment that we had a, a live performance video go viral of a song of ours, No Choice, and now <laughs> in that video, that crowd happened to jump crazy that night at that specific part. I don't know if they do that every night uh, prior to that, but we happened to get a video of that. And now every single show we play, no matter if it's a sold out show or one of the smaller B markets or whatever it is that part comes up and everyone's like, this is the part of the video where we're supposed to jump, <laughs> you know? Right, right. And, uh, so so we, we see that. And, um, and my last thought on that is that it's also given us a lot of love and appreciation for our back catalog because we still sometimes upload videos from two albums ago and new songs go viral. That song, I mean, how old is No Choice, right? Yeah, I mean, at least two, two albums, right? Yeah, two and, albums, and right? that, that, um, that was a video from our Asia tour and uh, it has, has a brand new life now, you know? So I think it, it gives us a lot of um, appreciation for the longevity of our music through these platforms, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's super inspiring. And I want to just like hold on that moment for a second because, uh, you know, we hear about older songs catching and going viral and TikTok, of course, but, you know, the, the most famous example of like Fleetwood Mac early on and just like having another you know, this viral moment. But like in practice, with a working new, new, I mean, I would still call you kind of a new band. Um, it's like, uh, as artists, um, you know, I think we are so obsessed with what's next and what is new. And we, our favorite things is what we wrote most recently and what is the newest and what has come out the most recent. So to like still have uh that um even just like e emotional energy to take an old song from years ago and spend the time and the effort to cut a video to that and upload it uh instead of prioritizing just the new songs and and making more videos like that like what is that thought process and clearly it worked but like why did you do that and 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 is it challenging or or what's that emotional process for you to go through thinking about like I'm going to make a video to an old song or I'm going to make a video to a new song and like yeah it's just like separating yourself as like the artist and the editor and the marketer and the all of that it's like a, an emotional roller coaster at least for me just thinking about it I'm curious what you guys go through in in this and maybe it's just by the book Yeah I'll say that it feels very um yin and yang you know Slavo is uh the producer on the project. So a lot of the time after we write the song and we're working on the new track and he's really going deep in on this production, maybe, you know, prior to both of us cutting vocals, maybe after, um, I'm able to sort of check out, um, and, and kind of put on the marketing hat. Uh, and okay. through that process, I, I just see our, our whole catalog is this, you know, one, one piece of work. And, um, of course, we're always promoting the new stuff, but I think, and Slava, let me know if you agree with this, but I, I just feel like um, we have seen success doing that. So I have no qualms about putting a, up a video tomorrow from a very old song just because we feel like it and it may not do great and we just move on. Um, and it's kind of, I, it, I think, freeing ourselves from that. And to Slavo's point, that song I was just referring to, No Choice, um, we had done tons of mm -hmm. content when it first came out. And maybe the visual wasn't right for it. And maybe the audio needed yeah. the right visual accompaniment. Maybe the song we're promoting right now, it's not the right soundbite. And maybe a year from now, I'll maybe run a clip with the bridge instead. You know, And I think there's so much potential there. Um, and, and for me, it's exciting. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't go viral for every you know several videos of ours that have gone viral. But I could talk on and on about the different ways we've been able to capture viral videos. And I'd say a majority of them were on pieces of content that we wouldn't have expected to go viral, right? Yeah, there's so many things that this topic 
makes me think of um, a lot of really cool things um, and a lot of you know funny things. Um, the first funny thing is that I I think you and I can uh, acknowledge the fact that the fact that this has happened to a song that we both enjoy is really important. Um, you know, we have so many songs, like we mentioned our first few Brooklyn karaoke, where we've always joked that if something from our past went viral, we would be able to swallow it and play it every night. And that would be the biggest thing. But I think there is some that we kind of look at each other and go, but if it was that one, I don't know, you know? Yeah. So I think for us, it's like the fact that it's going, sure. it's happening to songs that we really love. And like, if those are, you know, what becomes the brand of, of what people think of when they think of us, that's cool. That's fine with us these songs specifically. So th I think that helps it a lot too. I think we, mm -hmm. and Justin's really good at, at looking past this. I think we acknowledge the fact that whatever it takes to get people to look at our project is important because they're going to go check out the discography and we've got it. You know what I mean? If they want to go check yes. it out, it's there for you to listen to. So it depends on how much you're into that, you know, viral video. If you want to, hopefully we're, we're engaging enough to where you want to explore more. And that's the whole point, right? It's like you want people to, to become a fan and uh, whatever it takes to do that is, is, great to us. You know, we're down to do it. Um, and the last thing it makes me think of is our buddy Jake Miller, who had a song that went viral in China. I don't know if you're familiar with this story, but it's more recent. And it's, I mean, he's been doing this for longer than we have, and it's given his project a whole new life in a different way. He is like basically starting off as like basically the superhero of, of music over there. He's playing, uh, insane rooms, insane festivals. And, um, to the point where I know he's kind of put, you know, the U.S. touring uh, aside for a second, saying, "Hey, let me explore this." And and the fact that a song that he put out, and I don't even know, do you know when? Uh, Twenty fifteen. It was uh, on his first major deal that has been a long, long, long time ago. Yeah, and it's given his his project and even him, I'm sure, just a, a whole new perspective in life. And I think that's awesome, and that's why we do music, right? It's like we can't we, yeah. we don't understand what resonates or why it's going to happen, but when it does, it's awesome, and you just want to be there for the moment and do as much as you can to, to soak it all in. And I was just going to say, we're like Slavo said, we're so proud of the music we're making. So, you know, whether it takes three years for it to come to its, you know, full realization or, you know, 10 years, um, I, there's just so many, yeah, I, I, I could literally go on and on about our viral videos and even like we edited one over rain, uh, falling once. And that was one of our biggest viral videos. And that was because I was so frustrated with all the performance videos that I just said, let me just put it over rain because, you know, why not? And, and there we go. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of <laughs> ridiculous how that happens, you know? Yeah. How precious are you with, these videos for the short form videos? That, that's a great question. I'd actually, and Slava, I think you'd agree with this. I think maybe that was the biggest difficulty in our career so far, I think, because YouTube was this precious item for us that everything that went on yes. YouTube, uh, to, your, to what you brought up earlier, Ari, like even our covers were so high quality and we made sure that we really invested in lenses that, that um, made it stand uh, apart. And I think a difficult transition for us that we still have to check each other on is this new age. It's almost the opposite now that um, this grounded mm -hmm. approach is uh, resonating more. So I'm trying to mm -hmm. adapt to that more. So I, I guess to answer your question, I'm trying to be a lot less precious and a lot more like, mm. of course, we want it to be a good reflection on us and always be a positive experience. But um, yeah, I don't know. We used to like delete things back in the day that didn't work, right? Remember that? Like it's just... Yep. A, it's a Absolutely. different time. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it's like when it's funny, I, I tend to be the devil's advocate of the group. Um, Justin's down to shoot everything at the wall and see what sticks. And, and for me, like I, I tend to maybe have a little bit more of a precious brain when it comes to stuff. He recently was pushing, you know, those rain videos and even like he was going to getting into anime over our music. And to me, I sat with him. I was like, Hey man, listen, this stuff's working, but as a band, like, what is our brand, right? When someone sees that, if that's what they see, do you want that to be what they, they think of us as? And I think for me, it's yeah. hard to get past the idea of, okay, this is a platform where that stuff's going to get buried. You're going to see it. It'll go. You'll come back, see a different video. And acknowledging also that a lot of our fans are into anime. So the fact that that's resonating with them makes sense. Um, it might not be in my brain specifically what I think is the coolest thing and what I want to be you know, shown as a brand for, for what mm -hmm. we're doing. But it's working, and and if it's working, why not keep pushing that? It's not completely out of left field, um, and I know we had a conversation about that, and that's still something where I try to get my you know brain to think, okay, it's not as important to really 
think about that branding aspect in every, especially on this platform. You know, it depends on the platform, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I mean, I was going to ask you about kind of the anime angle and um, I mean, like even it, just the animation in general, like even the in the night uh, lyric video, uh, it's it's this animation loop. Uh, I don't know if it's AI generated or if you had somebody or, or what it, what it is or but um, yeah. And I noticed like even one of your TikToks, uh, which had some animation, uh, which I thought was really well done in the sense that it was a multi. It was almost like a comic book thing. It was a, it was a multi. It was like a carousel of images, animated images with the lyrics on it. And to get to the next lyric, you had to swipe. I've never seen that before. That was pretty cool where I'm like, I'm following along with the lyrics by swiping the images on the TikTok carousel, which I thought was really, really well done. But yeah, where did the anime, where did the animation thing come from? And I do want to get to your your Asia tour also, because I know like this anime is bigger in you know, Asian culture, but but talk to me about yeah, this. Yeah, so um, to acknowledge uh, the In the Night lyric video um, and... Uh, that yep. artist, um, Fahar, I forget his last name, um, but he's overseas. Uh, we've been working with him since the, the rerunning album. Yep. Um, so he uh, he's done a lot of those art loops for us. Cool. We've kind of um, empowered him to go in a little bit of a different artistic direction for some of the newer stuff. Mm -hmm. um, funny enough, just to acknowledge this, In the Night and Different Lives are the two songs on the last record that have lyric videos and not official videos in there are both most successful videos on YouTube, <laughs> yeah. um, which, you know, goes to show you something sometimes. Um, but uh, yeah, I think animation has always been interesting to us. Uh, I think the anime thing specifically, um, it's been an interest of mine in maybe the more the last couple of years. Um, and I find that a lot of our music at the time that was romantically driven, there's some beautiful... Um, you know, romance animes. And I think, and this has only been reaffirmed by our experience with the Asia tour, but um, the connection of viewers to anime, that sort of niche, they, they get their nails in the content so much that those are the sort of fans mm. that I've always wanted. Those are the sort of super fans that I want to bring over to our project where sometimes more mainstream top 40 fans are, you know, whatever's on the radio, they don't even know who the artist is. And that's totally fine. And they're just fans of songs. But for me, I think my initial thought was, you know, um, I think one of the, the first ones was Infinitely Falling. I had edited over um, a movie called Weathering With You. And, uh, and I think mm -hmm. to me, I was like, if we could get fans of that movie to feel like this song could be a sync or license for that movie, um, Th that's my goal. And I, and I think that led into some other ideas of like, how can we, you know, do these like fake pseudo sync and licenses in movies and TV shows and live action stuff that we have done. And we've, we've had success with as well. I think yeah. too, it's like, um, when it comes to all this anime stuff, right? The biggest thing to acknowledge is that we're not on the screen, right? It doesn't require us to be on the screen. Mm -hmm. So for mm -hmm. us, productivity mm -hmm. wise, our fans might be like, Oh, this is not the sexiest thing for you to say, but it allows us to do stuff and be productive in the social world without, you know, taking time away from the studio time and, and the stuff that maybe, you know, we yeah. could spend our time uh, other places. And and the fact that it's still um, capturing people's attention is the most important thing, right? So we're not doing it just to fill up space. Mm -hmm. It's working, which for us is like a blessing. You know, we're able to, to balance all the stuff and use that as maybe like a way to, to give ourselves a week to do other stuff um, yeah. where it's necessary. So I also yeah. think to, to piggyback off of that, it also... Sometimes, and there's nothing wrong with saying this, but sometimes people may want to like a song of ours and don't like the way we look or the way we're performing. And I think, so you're capturing an, another audience that may just like the song. Uh, and I genuinely believe uh, one of the VIPs on this tour that comes to mind, he had, he had mentioned that he had seen this anime video. Maybe he showed up to that show not even knowing what we looked like. And, uh, and who knows? You know, I, I think it also gave us that sort of freedom too that, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes the way we look or the way we perform sometimes may not be for everyone. And it kind of sneaks you into the project uh, through a different, different door. Yeah. That's cool. And I, I like, um, yeah, how um, experimental you guys are with this and how I, I would argue just from hearing this for the last while, how uh, unprecious you are, not a word, but we we know. Um, <laughs> Slavo and I we're just gonna be making yeah, up words about like this whole time. Again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but it, but it's like you know because I, I was going through your feeds both on Instagram and TikTok, 
And like the things that caught, it was just surprising to me uh, that so many different kinds of videos were catching at different points. And it didn't seem to be much of a rhyme or reason. Like usually when you look at an artist's profile that have gone viral, the temptation to just do that exact same thing that has worked over and over and over and over again, beat that to death is so strong. And that's the traditional thinking. Every TikTok expert I've talked to is just like, throw a bunch of shit at the wall, whatever sticks, whatever goes viral, do more of that and just keep doing that. And people get fatigued of that. And, and we've seen that that is a trap that a lot of people fall into and it just stops working after a while. Whereas like, you know, you have live performance videos that, I mean, I, I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like the biggest in the night videos uh, is just a, on TikTok and Instagram where it's like a small, a short clip of you performing live, which is cool. Like no hook on the screen, no words. Like, can you believe that this, you know, what? like none of that bullshit. It was literally just like the lyrics and you performing live. But then you also have the anime, you have the rain videos and you have music video clips. And like, talk to a little bit more of that experimentation. I think to, to me, the most exciting thing about what TikTok is into right now, at least from what my perspective, is the idea of like these personal detailed lyrics and they don't really care about a hook. They just want like, what's the story? What's the most unique thing that you can say that makes me feel something? And a lot of it's like acoustic based, which is cool. Um, where like, I feel like for us as artists now, we're like, okay, where it used to be like, come up with this like kind of brainless hook where you could dance to it. Now it's becoming more of like a, how could we get like really storytelling with this, which has always been our bread and butter besides writing a hook, but like making this verse that, you know, we could put a clip up on TikTok where In the Night is a great example. It's just, we've, we, uh, we shoved the verse down everyone's throats and they just kept eating it, you know? Um, so it's now we're able to like kind of put our brains in that perspective. Not saying that we're influenced by TikTok because I don't think we've ever even acknowledged that. But I think the idea of that being something that does well is exciting for us because now it's like, oh shit, this is what we do. This is what we love to do. And um, if, you know, the right thing catches it, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and I think sub. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Ari, continue. Go oh, ahead. I was just going to say, I, I think subconsciously it is. You know, it's like one of those things where, you know, you see a verse do well, and also you, to your point, some of our viral videos have had, you know, this hook of like, wait for it, you know, or whatever it is, and uh, and then uh, other ones like that in the night one, yep. um, it, it's just the lyrics, and then they kind of speak for themselves, and. Um, I, I, I think that's also been a very freeing thing for us to see both work. So it's like, sometimes mm -hmm. maybe we could just put out the lyrics and if that doesn't work, then maybe we'll get yeah. a little bit, you know, sillier with these sort of hooks without trying to lose our soul in the process. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I want to talk about that soul crushing process, but, uh, to speak to that a little bit of, of, um, you know, because there is experimentation, but there is also strategy. And I noticed that too, because you said we beat that verse to death and we like knew that because that is a strategy It's just like, it's, you know, and a lot of people, a lot of artists either have heard this and maybe, uh, but, but it's very hard for a lot of artists to post video after video after video with the exact same sound bite and that exact same clip. You guys are really good at that. But one, my question is, how do you know which soundbite is the correct one uh, to, to capitalize on and, and make videos to? And then two, uh, is that challenging for you? Do you feel annoying or whatever that you're going to post 10 videos in a row that all have that same soundbite? Or what is the what is the thought process around all of this? I'll let you speak on that. I just want to say, ironically, we, we make fun of people that do that and then we do it anyway. So, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. So, it's so true. <laughs> I know. It's so true. It's, yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so tell me about yeah, it. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll say that, um, like Slavo said, we we never really know what parts are going to work of a song. Um, In the night's a great example. Right. I, I when we wrote that song and uh, the lyric part under the stars is when I'm over the moon. We all felt like. Also, by the way, Slavo wrote that part. I'll give you credit on that. Um, Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, I, I was so captivated by that as a whole. I remember saying, "I want to put that on a T-shirt in general." Right. So it, I, mm -hmm. I felt when we were writing that that if that song came out, that needs to be the first thing you hear, and uh, and we'll try it. You know, for my ego, I was like, "Oh man, I hope the hook works because that's when I'm singing." <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, yeah. and uh, I call those tattoo lines. Yeah, uh, where like the 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 lyric is so good that you would tat someone would tattoo it onto their bodies, and it's like you want to have those tattoos, and that's a great example of it. We've seen some fans yeah. do some cringe versions of of that, and some great ones, but a lot of cringe. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, uh-huh. um, nice, but nice. I'll also say, and I think it's really important to say this for any artist, uh, a fellow artist that's listening to this too. I think our new wave is understanding that when we're writing for this record, there will be some songs that find success, but are not social media successful songs. Um, and I think that's something that we're beginning to understand that even our, our song tomorrow, that is, is that one that's, uh, that's not a 50 million, that's a, t- a 20 million or a 30 million stream song. We never had, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we ever had a social media moment with that per se. And um, mm. that was just a slow burn of some editorial looks and just people that genuinely love that song. And maybe one day we'll still figure out how to social media kick that. But I think for me yep. with this new wave, maybe our song try, it will just be the one that gets people to buy tickets or maybe the weather will yep. be the one that is the social media song. So I think um, mm-hmm. it, it you try to make everything the social media song, you try to give it the shot. But for me, it's a little better to know that not every single one may find success in that lane. And I think that's been freeing and better for my morale as we're trying this stuff to not beat myself yeah. up as much when an idea I had, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily work all the time. Yeah. Cool. Um, what, what kind of representation do you have at this point? We still have a, a pretty small team. Um, we've been with our manager, uh, Matt at Mantis music group for how many years now? Th- three. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. It was like uh, post pandemic. I know that, so it's got to be maybe three years. Okay. Right? Yeah, and um, and then we brought out um, a tour manager, uh, Lane, uh, who now um, we've sort of moved over to uh, management with Matt. Um, so he's on. So now we have nice. two managers there, which is cool. Um, and they're great. Uh, we've been with Prescription on the publishing side um, since the pandemic. We had mm-hmm. signed with our A and R Christian in Nashville, and we hadn't met him right. for. <laughs> six months or so, some crazy shit like that. And we hugged him and it, and it was it, when we met him in person, it was very weird uh, just seeing him. Nice. Um, but they've been extremely instrumental. And I know, you know, Ari, I'm a fan of the podcast and I see a lot of people come on here and, you know, uh, be in not great situations sometimes. And when I hear, or previously, et cetera, and when I hear those stories, I'm mm-hmm. so grateful that over the trajectory of our career so far, the people that we've let in, um, really have not been detrimental um, and really have understood the project. Uh, so we have prescription mm-hmm. on the publishing side there. Um, our a is great with sessions, but our the sync team over there are the most badass women, I think, in the industry. And they are... Um, what, awesome. what they have done for our career, um, I, I think, is arguably as influential as the social media stuff. Um, and from nice. there, uh, we just um, signed... Well, I guess okay. not signed. I, I don't know what you call agents these days. I, we just sh- hand shook with, uh, with uh, UTA um, originally internationally, but now we just uh, launched uh, worldwide with them on the, the agency side. Who, uh, so who set up your previous tours if, if you didn't have booking representation? So our first... Um, so, so we had done support tours prior. Uh, our best friend Jake Miller took us out. Um, which mm-hmm. was just, you know, just being best friends and writing for his project as well and having a song with him. And, um, and then from there, well, we were direct support for Teddy Swims and, uh, same exact thing. He texted us. How did that happen? Yeah. He texted us saying, Bo- oh, boys, sick. you want to, y'all want to tour together? <laughs> we wrote a bunch of stuff with wow, Teddy, uh, cool. early on and he's the sweetest dude. Okay. I mean, as, as cool. talented and as sweet as, as you see online is what he is in person. But, um, we wrote a lot of cool stuff together and there's one that, you know, I, who knows, we, you know, we play that game of if it'll ever come out and I, he probably supports it more than we'll ever know, uh, to his label, but maybe one day that'll sure. see the light of day. But if anything, you know, we got the experience to tour with them and his team and the, the, the touring group is some of our best friends whenever we run into them. It's a, it's a nice moment. And, uh, yeah, cool opportunity for us. And uh, same thing, like, you know, talk about industry that I feel like that tour, at least in the touring world, to give us a lot of cred. Uh, so we appreciate him for that. You know, it helped us out in a lot of ways, I think. Awesome. But but yeah, to continue that. So our support tours um, have never really been through agents. Uh, we Our first headlining tour, uh, The Paint Your Feelings, was done uh, through through sort of an, an agent that we had this, you know, 
you know, can you route this one tour for us? We had another agent as well uh, quite recently, and she was extremely instrumental um, uh, with getting uh, the, the direct support for Arizona, um, who are now, uh, again, mm-hmm. one of our close friends. It's always so cool when you get to tour with people and you become quite close with them. Um, and uh, so, yeah, cool. we, we've sort of bounced around and try to figure out that world. Um, and now, you know, uh, leading with optimism, hopefully this next chapter for us being we will never stop being hands on. I think we've we're building a team in that agent space that know how hard we work. So now it's just uh, you know hoping yes. that um that you know they they also bring stuff to the table as well. Yeah, and and um and and what about uh, oh I was just gonna ask what about uh, on the uh, the label side the distro side what do you what's the story around that now Yeah, I was gonna say um so. I'd say 90% of our career has been released through DistroKid um, after after oh, wow. reading Ari's take on uh, the distro uh, <laughs> reviews. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, but, uh, Wait, are they good or bad? I'm sorry. A <laughs> distro comparison article. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, that's what I was telling you at the Grove today that I was like, uh, uh, I read that article years ago. Uh, Ari, you were pretty transparent, right? Like you said DistroKid's a no frills experience, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, exactly, totally. to be honest, that's exactly what we've always been with them for. This sort of like, don't awesome. expect shit uh, and do everything for yourselves. And um, mm-hmm. and now uh, we're in a new chapter. We just um, put pen to paper with this this new release uh, with STEM for the first time. Um, okay, and, uh, cool. And they'll be taking on this, this next project with us. And it's beautifully nice. um, nerve wracking and uh, and exciting in a lot of ways. Yeah. I'll tell you what. Too previously, um, and I'm I'm unfamiliar with your uh, distro breakdown, so apologies there. But um, so if if this strikes a chord, then I'm I'm also sorry for that. But the uh, <laughs> the ten percent that I think uh, that Justin's referring to is the um, the brief stint we had. We did like an EP with um, Snafu, which I don't. They're not a distributor, so he wouldn't have. Uh, okay, true. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But so no. Uh, no, but they they are. I'm familiar with Snafu. They're actually coming on the the program um, at, to talk about their model. But but explain their model a little bit. They're they're kind of an advanced funding kind of situation, right? Justin would definitely be able to speak more to that. He's he's got the business brain. He's tapped in there more than I am. But I will say, um, experience wise, and STEM is we're just getting into bed with them, so this is going to be new for us. But um, the Snafu experience was something where it was short enough. So it wasn't intimidating for us to be like, okay, we're going to spend this much time with this label and, and, and do this. It was a cool introduction to us what it could be like to work with the team around our music. Um, and one of our, I think actually our biggest stream song, um, Automatic, came from them. And I want to say, to be transparent, it was they had the, uh, the first pass at what was Discovery Mode. Uh, for Spotify, and they were like on the cusp mm-hmm. of being tapped into that, and I feel like that had, a, if not most of the success of that song, but um, a lot of it was uh, due to that. And it's one of those things, like when it comes to working with different teams, right? We don't know what STEM's gonna, uh, you know, inevitably do for us. But I think the the cool thing that we could take from that experience was, however we felt about it, is one thing, but we got that from them being on our team. And I don't know if we ever would have done that without them and the the success of the song might not have seen what it was able to see. So um, yeah, I don't know exactly why I'm saying all this, but I think it's the the point is... No, I'm I'm curious. Yeah, I, I'm curious. Well, then what is the what was the decision to, to now go with STEM who you seem to have a uh, phenomenal success um, releasing songs independently through DistroKid where you keep 100% of the royalties. I know STEM takes uh, 10% or, or something of that around that for, for most artists, I would imagine. Um, you know, I know STEM is probably going to argue they're more hands-on. You're going to have a representative there. You don't have to go through the customer support portal, et cetera, et cetera. So talk to me about why STEM versus DistroKid versus uh, a label that, you know, would would have ownership. Yeah, so to, to touch on that, I think going back to Snafu, um, that was structured like a very, very fair uh, indie label deal. Um, but there were, you know, I'll, I'll say that Slave and I still wear their hoodie. So, uh, you know, we're still on good terms with them. But I think 
we uh, we it's comfy as hell too. It is comfy. Uh, that may be the best part. Maybe the best part of the label. Just kidding. Um, but uh, <laughs> Jesus, he's about to see them. We, we, it's a joke. Tell him we said hi. Um, no, but uh, I will. I will. It, but the truth is actually um, what what I what's interesting about that label, and I'm sure you'll talk to them about this. But they've had many different iterations of that label, right? Where uh, our friends uh, in the in the duo Joan were signed to them years before us, and completely different team when we signed. Uh, completely different team. None of the people that we signed with, like the five people we worked with, work there anymore. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh, wow. So, okay. so there are a lot yeah, of different. That happens with labels. Yeah. So there's a lot of different iterations. So any feelings we have, I mean, we only worked with those people, right? So, um, but I think we we got along mm-hmm. with them well. I th- we still stay in touch with uh, a majority of them as well. Um, but I think there were aspects of that deal that we've educated ourselves on that we were like, okay, we went back to DistroKid. It wasn't for us. That's great. And if we ever sign a deal again. You know what are we looking for, and um, stem check those boxes. So to be transparent, it's in my opinion, I, I sort of roll my eyes when artists say, you know, um, I signed to a distribution deal but not a label deal. The the structure of our deal now with stem is an extremely extremely generous artist friendly. It's a label deal, right? Like um, I don't think there's any way to call. Sure, they're distributing our music, but. In many ways, um, it's just a very, very friendly, master reverse licensed, you know, label deal. Um, and I sure. think our thought process is we are beginning to grow on a more global scale. And we, mm-hmm. the primary walls we're hitting with our last record too is we're getting these looks in certain different countries on different DSPs and localized DSPs. And the the hope here is. Of course, there's a lot of expectations, but going with a bigger partner here um, and also signing like a proper you know deal on a project, hopefully on a global scale, our team hopes that this will be a really strong asset and to really tap into the you know the Southeast Asian markets, the Euro- European market. Um, and I think for me, that's what I really hope and kind of what we've been started with there. Uh, and the team has been great so far. We have a lot of boots on the ground and a lot of people that. You know, seem to be excited with what we're what we're making so far. Yeah, awesome. No, that's great to hear. So, so tell me what's coming next. So, you have um, the the race lap one third out now, uh, but I'm I know that that is uh, that is teasing something more to come. So, what what can you share that is coming up for the rest of 2024 for you guys? Yeah, I mean, there's no uh, hiding here that we're our goal is to have an album out. Um, we're not gonna. Uh-huh. Um, say when, but uh, we have this whole plan, which for the first time for us, I feel like we're looking so far ahead and we're not used to that. So <laughs> bear with us as we do it, fans. Uh, hopefully we don't fuck it up. But um, I feel like for us, um, it's exciting because we were able to establish a brand that we really were passionate about early on, which is, you know, even as late as the last tour. I mean, for us, that's a long time ago um, with how quick we move. So that was exciting to be able to have that and then even think ahead and have you know, this release strategy be something fresh for us. And I think that was probably the biggest reason why we decided to do this race lap one of three um, is how we're calling it. Um, was the idea of, you know, previously we we did single releases and we waterfalled them, but we did it in a manner where it just felt like we were, you know, it was just this whole long extended brand until an album came. And for us, we wanted to feel a little more like localized to where like, this is what we're currently doing. We're going to write a little more and this is what we're doing. And then the idea is that it gets to a point where you know it's all branded as one, but it's exciting because we were able to do it in a u- unique way for us, but also be creative each step of the way, which I think is cool. Yeah, and I think yeah. that, uh, yeah, I think f- for the first time we have fans because sometimes we like you know we, we name albums and we do certain Easter eggs and just no one uh, notices and we're like shit. <laughs> Uh, but I'd say for this for this one, this is the first time that people are like, "Oh, this is the first lap of a race." Are there two other laps? Yeah. Um, and uh, right. and I guess we'll we'll have to find out. But I think, um, yeah, we're we're really excited to to have a little bit more of a, of an idea of what's to come and and a new album and hopefully a new tour. And we're really excited to play in places that we haven't before and play in places again in bigger rooms than we ever had before. And I think. Um, right currently, right now, what what is exciting both of us is being studio rats and taking some time off, spending time with our wives, um, spending time 
enjoying Los Angeles and just writing music uh, that excites us. And and yeah. uh, and I think it's a nice little change of pace right now. Yeah, I think too, it's fun to acknowledge for anyone listening that you know, as organized as we might feel currently, we're also still writing everything uh, you know fresh. So like we're our our goal today after this is to go over the the last however many songs we wrote and pick something for the next release. You know what I mean? So we're at that point where it's like as organized as we are, we're still working on the next song. Um, which I think is funny because sometimes people from the outside are like, oh, they're so organized. They're so, you know, they have everything together. It's so well in advance. They probably think of this stuff so far ahead. And it really is like for us, maybe that's just how we've worked and how, you know, it works for us. But it's always been like a peer, like it's all together, but like kind of work as we go. It drives our team fucking crazy. Yeah, so, sorry, it. sorry, Matt, sorry, Lane. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? But the thing is, the dirty little secret in the new music business is that no one fucking knows what's going on or what to do. Yeah. And everyone's looking to the artist. So even though it drives them crazy because they don't understand that workflow, it works for you guys. And honestly, that's all that matters. And, uh, you know, they're like, that's the thing is just like teams are there to support artists. And you've clearly cracked the code for what works for Fly By Midnight. And nobody's going to know that better than you. And so, like, you know, your team, that is part of the process, is just trusting you guys and trusting the process to know that you know what's going on. And your instincts have proved correct time and time again since Justin was in his bedroom with a camera on YouTube to now. Yeah. So, like, you know, it's cool to see that evolution and, and the and the sound progression and and all of it. And and um, just to kind of come full circle, uh, I love these these new three songs. Thank um, you. Yeah, I think personally, I think it's some of your best work. Uh, Super fine is never leaving my head. But try is also beautiful song as well. And it's like I, I I think you're right. I think that song has a lot of potential and it and is going to be a kind of a slow burn for a lot of people as well. Um, I have one final question that I ask everybody who comes on the show. Uh, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? Oof. Who knows, man? <laughs> Dude, like that's we have that conversation all the time where like we're such a slow burn project that like is there gonna be a point where we look at each other and we're like, oh, we've done it? Because I feel like at this point, um the 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 most basic answer is we're able to, to live off doing this, which I think is to us, you know, mm -hmm. um keeps us happy. Yeah. But you know, we still rent. We don't own a home, um, and it's very difficult to do that in LA, as a lot of people know. Um, so, like, I don't know, yeah. like, you could break down exactly, what, you know, where what it means to us, but I don't think we really know ourselves. Like, I think we still look at each other every day and we go, "Have we done it? Are we good? Like, do we still need to push for bigger and better?" And you know, grass is greener cliches insert here, but like, that's I think that's where we're at. Yeah, I, I would say. Um... I, I think if I could choose a goal for Slavo and I, you know, when we first started the project, it was like, you know, for me, number one, play arenas across, you know, the world. But now I think as we're getting mm -hmm. older and, and, you know, we have, you know, families of our own. And I just hope that we build longevity for as long as we want to keep doing this. And I think that, it, and, and that sounds humble and silly, but like, I, I really am like continually grateful that we get to, you know, write music full time because it was not always that way. You know, lift driving, waitering, we could go on and on. You know, there was a, a serious grind here, and we've been able to do this full time for like almost five years now. And um, and it's to me, it's just longevity and security. I think if we could keep that up and really set ourselves up for the rest of our lives doing music, I think that's that's making it um way more than a spin on top forty radio, uh, which my mom flipped out over that one time that happened. But oh yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> Today's episode was edited by Ari Davids with music by Brassroots District and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.